extent that uh, if it, you know me, uh, you probably know me from junkscience.com. Um, I also manage a group called the Free Enterprise Action Fund, along with uh, Tom Borelli, who's in the audience. Um, to uh, this, this panel is about politics, and I'm going to talk about the politics of climate change on a federal level. Uh, but I first want to pay some uh, respect to my junkscience.com roots. I will uh, just reiterate some of the messages that um, we heard earlier today in the lectures by uh, Lord Monkton and Willie Soon and Fred Singer and Ken Ball. Um, we come at this as, uh, you know, the notion that humans are uh, altering global climate for the worse is utter hogwash. Um, despite, uh, you know, you, it, it can be very confusing. You hear a lot of issues, polar bears, the Antarctic, the Arctic, sea level rise. Um, there's lots of issues going around. There's really only one thing that you have to keep in mind. And the central issue in climate change is does carbon dioxide drive global climate? More particularly, does the human emissions of carbon dioxide drive global climate? The answer to that is no. Nothing else, you know, what we're talking about is regulating greenhouse gases. None of that stuff matters if there's no relationship, okay? And to find out if there's a relationship, it's really simple. You just gotta look at two pieces of evidence. And you can look at a temperature graph of the 20th century mapped against carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, emissions pretty much go straight up. Temperature varies all over the place. No relationship between the two. Um, if you look at Inconvenient Truth, Al Gore goes back 650,000 years looking at the ice core record. What he doesn't mention <laughs> is that increases in temperature actually precede increases in CO2 by hundreds of years or more. Okay, so there's no relationship between CO2 and climate. And so we just, this is total nonsense. Yet, yet we are way down the road toward getting climate regulation, toward having greenhouse gases regulated, towards having carbon dioxide declared essentially a toxic substance. Now how do we get, how do we get to this point? And at what point are we at actually? Well, I guess we'll start with, we'll start there. Uh, right now there's a bill that has been passed out of the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee came out last December. It's called Lieberman Warner. Uh, started out in life as McCain Lieberman, but John McCain's running for president, so he can't have, uh, can't have that name attached to it. So it's now Lieberman Warner. And what they want to do, the bill will do, is you know, allegedly reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 70% by 2050. And uh, the way they would do that is through a cap and trade system. Cap and trade is basically the Congress would set ever declining levels of permitted greenhouse gas emissions. Emitters, mostly big companies, power plants, would be issued permits. Um, if you emit less carbon dioxide than uh, you have a permit for, you can sell you know, your remaining permit. If you emit more than what you have permits for, then you have to buy it. That's cap and trade. Um, environmentalists like to call this a market-based system, but uh, since all the prices are basically set by Congress and it's a made-up problem to start with, you know, I don't think that's very market-based. So this bill has now come out of Senate Environment and Public Works Committee and could be on the floor of the Senate at any moment. Anytime the Democrats want to bring that bill to the floor, uh, they can. And I think that they're holding off because uh, you know, they don't have enough votes to hold off a, a cloture fight. The Republicans still have 40 or more votes um, that would, would block the bill from, you know, ultimately being voted on, but, you know, the Republicans have been so squishy lately that uh, the bill could be brought to the floor at any time. Now, how, how have we got here? This is really what I want to talk about. It's really the most important piece of this. You know, a lot of people think it's Al Gore and his movie An Inconvenient Truth. He really brought global warming to the public consciousness. People are paying attention. He's scared school children. He's testified in Congress, persuaded many people. And there's some truth to that. It's not entirely inaccurate. Uh, there's also, you know, the environmentalists have been clamoring for this for, um, since 1978. I mean, they, 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 when they started working with the UN was uh, late 1970s on climate. And um, so, I mean, they have, they have achieved quite a bit of success since then. But what's really, but you know, the environmentalists only have so much political power. And Al Gore, well, there's only so many people that can take him seriously. 
Uh, otherwise, you know, we would have President Gore, not President Bush. Um, so what is it? Well, for many people who come from my side of the political spectrum, libertarians, free market, um, conservatives, it comes as quite a bit of a surprise. And what do you do when the people that you know, represent uh, business and free enterprise have switched sides on you? What do you do when these people are no longer fighting for free markets and free enterprise and for limited government regulation and for individual freedom? What do you do when they've all of a sudden <laughs> sided with the enemy and are now working against everything you've ever stood for or stand for and have worked for it? And and we've learned this the hard way at Junk Science. You know, when I first started out in this business, industry was interested in good science. They wanted regulation built on sound science. I mean, this got to the point where in 1994, when the Republicans took over Congress, you know, there was a movement for part of the contract with America was regulatory reform, risk assessment, cost-benefit analysis, and it was all great stuff. Of course, Republicans mismanaged it and just turned into a disaster. So we've got none of it. So here we are, 2008, and you know, business is no longer our ally. Uh, business is now pushing for global warming regulation. And why are they doing that? Well, it's a great money-making opportunity for them. It's a great money-making opportunity. Regardless of what the science is, it doesn't really make any difference. Um, if you're a company like General Electric, um, you can sell windmills. And if you set up a regulatory scheme where people are, people are uh, either tax credits or subsidized or other, otherwise incentivized to buy windmills, they will, and you'll make a lot of money. Um, I talked with an investigative reporter recently. He's uncovered that GE makes about uh, more than $800 million a year in subsidies from windmills. It's a lot of money. So GE is plenty incentivized to push for windmills and have a regulatory structure. Um, you have companies like Alcoa, Dow Chemical. These are companies that, you know, I guess they, they'll they claim they saw the writing on the wall 15 years ago when the UN first got together and started talking about climate change regulation. They started reducing their greenhouse gas emissions to the point where, you know, a lot of them have reduced their emissions by 50, 75 percent or more. And now they want to get paid for that. They want Congress to give them essentially free money, free carbon credits, um, and carbon credits that uh, they can then just turn around right away and sell in the marketplace. How much? Well, there was a bill introduced in the sum uh, last summer. It was called Bingham Inspector. And that bill would have, over the first 10 years, issued a trillion dollars in free money to global warming special <coughs> interests. Okay, so there's, there's a lot at stake. That's a lot of money. Now, if you're a stockholder, I mean, sounds like a great thing, right? I mean, short, you know, a trillion dollars going to uh, companies I know, that I own, sure. Uh, but, of course, there's a downside to this. Um, what happens when, you know, the reason the Europeans don't really live with the Kyoto Protocol is because it's an economy killer. The reason the Chinese want to have nothing to do with Kyoto is because it's going to stop their growth. The reason we don't have it in America so far is because, you know, the adults have said, you know, this is really going to hurt our economy. Nevertheless, business is pushing ahead and is taking us towards the precipice uh, because they don't really believe that. They somehow think that we're going to outgrow all, you know, all these regulations. So, uh, you know, they're ignoring the fact that you know, these regulations making energy more expensive, less available. Uh, curtailing economic growth, they don't really believe that it's going to hurt them. If last year at the uh, uh, shareholder meeting for General Electric, the CEO Jeff Immelt said that you know he thinks he could grow GE even in a declining economy. Okay, so he, he doesn't have a second thought about pushing for global warming regulation, even if it hurts the economy, because he thinks that he can make money in that economy anyway. I mean, we differ with that, but now <coughs> I have a a new, well, it's not really a new group. We've been doing this for about three years now. It's called the Free Enterprise Action Fund. It's a publicly traded mutual fund. Uh, we're the first ones to do this from our side of the spectrum. And what we do is we are shareholders in all these companies. 
you know, we realize that you know, the left has hijacked them for the purpose of advancing the left's social and political agenda. And the way they seduce these companies into doing this is um, you know, by uh, coaxing them or coercing them into go along, going along with what the left wants. And along the way, some of these CEOs thought, well, there's, you know, there's money in it for us. You know, if you're GE, you sell windmills. If you're Dow, you can get free credits. Um, if you're Goldman Sachs, you're Morgan Stanley. Well, you know, Goldman Sachs owns uh, the, the exchanges where these carbon credits would be traded. So they're just going to be the bookie. You know, they don't care. What, they're going to be making money whichever way it goes. Um, there are other companies that uh, are going along with this that I don't think they really know why. There's a, um, the most, perhaps the most well-known um, business lobbying group on this issue in D.C. is called U U.S. Climate Action Partnership. Its members include GE, Dow, Pepsi, Johnson & Johnson, BP, um, ConocoPhillips, and a bunch of other big companies. And they're lobbying pretty hard for climate regulation. One of the members is Pepsi-Cola. You know, what is Pepsi-Cola <laughs> doing getting involved with these people? Doesn't Pepsi realize that carbon dioxide goes into uh, a lot of its products? And what's going to happen when, um, and I've been through this before on a regulatory basis, when carbon dioxide is essentially declared a toxic substance, every Pepsi facility is going to become a national security threat. <laughs> right? Now, Pepsi's already seen the backlash from this. I don't know if you've, uh, bottled water has become all of a sudden within the last year politically incorrect. Why is that? Because why can't you just drink water out of the tap? You know, all that plastic is part of the oil, the transportation, it's global warming, blah, blah, blah. Um, yet Pepsi is lobbying for climate regulation, which is going to hurt its products. You know, not to mention raise, uh, you know, create an environment where its raw material costs are going to go up. Compact fluorescent light bulbs, we've all heard about those, right? Um, maybe a lot of you own them because you think that uh, maybe they're saving you money or they're saving the planet, whatever. Um, you know, 20 years ago, if you look back through the, the news media accounts, uh, the environmentalists were going nuts about fluorescence because fluorescence contain mercury. People throw them away in the household trash. It goes into incinerators in the atmosphere or into landfills. Mercury leaches out. They don't like that. Well, all of a sudden, the global warming comes along and uh, compact fluorescent light bulbs become a big thing because they can reduce um, carbon dioxide emissions from power plants. So the environmentalists get, get behind this because well, this is very exciting. You, have, you, know, you can actually buy a light bulb and help advance our agenda. Now, when you think about it, all these compact fluorescent light bulbs contain mercury. So the same mercury that the environmentalists hated before is now somehow okay because it's going to reduce global warming. But I think it's more sinister than that. Um, I think that you know, they normally, environmentalists have always wanted to take toxics out of our house, right? <laughs> As a former environmental defense person. Now they want us to bring them in our house. And by doing that, what, where do you throw away your, your – if you have compact fluorescent, just probably just throw them in the household trash. You're not supposed to. You know, every one of those bulbs needs to be thrown away especially. God help you if you break one. Um, you know, if you go on the EPA website or any state health agency, they'll tell you, you know, don't vacuum um, the debris. You've got to open the windows, brush it. You know, it's a whole nightmare. Um, and so we've got all this mercury that's going to be going into the environment. You know, there are 4 billion – light sockets in America that will take these bulbs. The environmentalists know this. Um, you know, they're really setting us up for another Superfund situation with mercury. Now, who's going to pay the bill? Well, uh, you know, GE that makes CFLs, Walmart that sells them, any business even it, that, that, that uses them. Uh, think about home-based businesses. If you remember the Superfund program, home-based businesses were raked over the coals uh, for, waste, for waste disposal practices, which were um, or I'm sorry, mom and pop businesses right over the coals for business for, for waste and social practices that were okay, perfectly legal at the time, but all of a sudden Superfund became retroactively incorrect. And that's what's going to happen with CFLs. Um, there's all this liability that the environmentalists are setting us up for, and industry is completely ignoring this. So what do we do at the Free Enterprise Action Fund? Well, we try to be uh, a problem for management on uh, – as shareholders. We're an institutional shareholder. We're, you know, kind of a small fund. We have about $12 million, but we're very good with the paperwork and a kind of a, a pain in the rear end for these people. Um, we, you know, primarily work through shareholder proposals, and we're trying to get shareholders and the CEOs to think about what they're doing. Um, 
we have filed numerous shareholder proposals with companies in the U.S. Climate Action Partnership, uh, GE, Dow, Pepsi, COA, and all we want them to get them to do is to start thinking about, you know, what are, what are we really after? What are we really going to get through climate regulation? Um, you know, is this really possible? Is our, is our fantasy of higher profitability from climate regulation going to come true? And when we approach the companies, we tell them, you know, you're in a group, uh, U.S. Climate Action Partnership, where none of you really have the same goal. You know, there are, there are companies like Duke Energy. Now, Duke Energy is, is an electric utility in the Carolinas. Um, most of what they uh, burn to produce electricity is coal. Okay, coal becomes a disfavored uh, fuel under uh, greenhouse gas regulation. Um, yet the CEO is in a group where he's lobbying for that. Now, to, see, to be fair to the CEO, he's, he's not for this cap and trade system because cap and trade works against coal. He's for a carbon tax. In a carbon tax would be a tax just you know, overlaid on top of all the other taxes that, that we pay. Not likely to happen. Most U.S. CAP members want cap and trade because they want those free credits. But even among, you know, and, and the environmentalists support cap and trade, but they support it, and they support it because, oh, you know, it's a market-based way to take care of global warming. Um, we talked about that earlier. It's not really a market-based way. But where the, where the environmentalists differ from industry is that industry wants the credits given to them for free, you know, a trillion dollars worth of free credits. The environmentalists want the credits auctioned. You know, you've got to pay for the credits. Now, industry doesn't want that. So... What, you know, what is the middle ground between all these groups? You know, right now, they're just sort of generally moving this legislation ahead, the notion that you know, something's going to happen, something needs to happen. We don't really know what it is. Um, and there's no way to really resolve our different positions. So what are, you know, what's going to happen with this? Um, and you know, I personally think that, well, in the end, what's going what's gonna to kill climate regulation is not the science, although the science should be what, what actually does it in. What's going to kill it is the fact that these U.S. cap companies can't arrive at an agreement what they want. Because there's no compromise between carbon tax, cap and trade, uh, cap and trade auction and free, uh, you know, auctioning credits and free credits. I don't see what the common ground is for any of those, those interests. So. Uh, you know, that may be our saving grace. In California in, 19, uh, in uh, 2006, there was a Proposition 87. Proposition 87 um, would have taxed all oil produced in California uh, to fund alternative energy research. The, um, the ballot initiative came from lobbying by companies like BP and Shell. Okay. Now, what BP and Shell were after was, was getting free credits from the California legislature. Well, the California legislature drafted the ballot initiative such that um, BP and Shell were gonna have to lobby the California regulators to actually get the credits. Well, they didn't wanna do that. So they wound up having to lobby against <laughs> the ballot initiative when it actually went to a vote in November. Now, fortunately, uh, they won. But I don't know, you know if we can afford to rely on that kind of, uh, I mean, the environmentalists, you know, the environmentalists in business have, have really sort of whipped us into this green frenzy now. And, and uh, you know, there's lots of money sloshing around Washington, D.C., pushing for green regulation. And, you know, we, we have, I believe, uh, 12 months to really stop this. You know, this bill that's in Lieberman Warner that's in Congress right now, um, you know, conceivably, Industry could realize that, you know, if Barack Obama wins in November, you know, he could go off the deep end and want to auction. You know, the only bill that could get through him is auctioning the credits. So maybe we should try to push George Bush on something and push something through Congress now so that we can get our free credits. And that could happen pretty quickly. And the Bush administration has already signaled that it's interested in doing some sort of deal. Um, at the G8 meeting this summer, you know, they're willing to uh, enter into some sort of um, greenhouse gas agreement. Um, George Bush says he wants flexibility, but, you know, who knows? We really, we really, we really don't know. We can't rest on our, um, you know, the great scientific presentations that we've seen. You know, we, 
we've convinced ourselves, we need to go out and convince the rest of the world. Uh, but we also need to pay attention to what these companies are doing. Um, you know, just because you know someone is a CEO of a company doesn't mean he knows what he's doing when it comes to climate change. Okay, I mean it's very important. You can't assume that the companies know um, what they're doing. Tom and I, we, we talk with these companies all the time about our shareholder proposals. We go to the meetings. We can't get answers from 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 the companies. Uh, th when they do talk, you can see that they have no idea what they're getting themselves in for. They don't know um, anything about their repugnance. Companies that belong to U.S. Climate Action Partnership, um, none of them know, okay, none of them know that the, the um, woman who is the head lobbyist for U.S. CAP, she's married to a founder of the Natural Resources Defense Council and current board member. Now, if I'm a shareholder of, pick your company, Duke Energy, Pepsi, um, do I really want um, the value of my company relying on an environmentalist uh, lobbyist? I mean, who's, who's, who's she going to cut the deal for? She's going to cut the deal for the environmentalist, not the business. Yet these companies, you know, they, they just, they don't, they don't even have this information, let alone are they, you know, I don't know, God knows what they would do if they knew who this woman was, but her name is Mary Bell Ayers. She's married to a guy named Dick Ayers. And, um, I mean, it, it's a horrifying situation. I, I hope I'm communicating that to you. Um, the, uh, the environmental defense, you know, they're, they're very crafty people. They have hired um, Ken Melman. For those of you who uh, are politically savvy, Ken Melman used to be the head of the RNC. They have hired him and his firm, Aiken, uh, Aiken Gump Strauss, Howard Feld, to lobby for the environmental defense on climate change. Okay? Ken Melman. Ken Melman is the guy that told George Bush not to sign Kyoto and to withdraw the U.S. from Kyoto in 2000, 2001. Okay? He's done a 180 degree turn. And now he's working for the environmentalists. Okay? We're in trouble. We have 12 months or so to work on this. These big companies are a problem. Those are the politics. So if you're interested in what we do, it's freeenterpriseactionfund.com. Uh, we're a public traded mutual fund. You know, we, we, we set ourselves up to be pesky shareholders. And uh, you know, we've got a lot of work to do. We hope you join us. Thank you very much.